Now I want to talk about how exactly to price your services, and I have four pricing strategies that I want to go over. These are not the only pricing strategies there are, but these are the most prevalent when it comes to uh, creative professionals. But first, let me start with this idea. Do you practice desperation pricing or profitable pricing? Right? Desperation pricing is basically pricing to get the job no matter what because you're desperate, and it's usually not that profitable versus profitable pricing where you have the tools in place, you know exactly how much you need to make, you know exactly what your profit margin is, you know exactly what the cushion is, as Justin was talking about. It's important to have the information in place and a system in place so that you can do this quickly, because if you can't do it quickly, then you're probably going to put it off or you're going to do it in a way that doesn't serve you well, all right? Or maybe even in a way that isn't logical, right? Because for some reason, Creative people seem to get kind of fuzzy when it comes to money and pricing. And so having these systems in place will prevent that from happening or maybe lessen it a little bit. OK, so four pricing strategies. The first one is the most common one, time-based. So pricing by the hour or pricing by the day or sometimes pricing by the word, which could be uh, time and materials, right? But pricing which is based on the concrete aspect of what you do. Now, I'm, I'm not saying this is better than that, but what I do notice is that a lot of people just automatically price by the hour because it's the easiest. All you have to do is multiplication, right? And also because often that's what the client asks for. The client may say, what's your hourly rate? And this is one of those political situations, in my opinion, where you don't have to accept the premise of the question. You can say, I'm sorry, I don't charge by the hour. I charge this other way. And then you explain why. So there are situations where it is not at all to your advantage to price hourly. And one of the main situations is when you have a lot of experience and you work quickly and you do a really good job, but it only takes you two hours, should you only price two hours worth? No, right? So you have to come up with some other way of pricing that is fair, that isn't you just adding on hours because you think it should be priced higher. There's another strategy that you approach with that. All right, so that's time-based. Project-based is an alternative to that. And project-based is also very clear and very popular. Uh, but it's a little bit trickier because you have to figure out what is involved in the project. There are many different factors. There is the amount of time. There is the administrative things you are doing. There is the value to the client. And you have to, and this comes with experience, figure out what is this project worth to me. And this is related to the example I used before where a website is worth $2,500, that's a project fee. And so what all is included in that to make sure that I'm covering all of my expenses plus my profit and that that is worth it to me, right? That's what you have to figure out for yourself. All right, the third pricing strategy is package-based pricing. And we talked a little bit about this in session two and session one, actually. And there are a couple different ways of approaching this. One is standard projects that are based on a package. So we used the example of website design. And Jill Anderson talked about her packages. She has four different packages. One is design, one is design and development, one is development only. And then there's the everything package, right? And this is possible and easier for people who are offering the same essential type of project or services to the same type of people. And again, I want to emphasize that that's why focusing is so important, because it allows you to package your prices. And when you can package your prices, you save so much time uh, in the conversation with the clients, because everything is clear. And all you need to do is say, well, you know, customize it sometimes for them. All right, maybe you don't need this, and we'll take this away. It, even if the packages themselves can't be applied to everyone, it's a really beautiful starting point for a conversation. You have something already on the table. 
Now a variation on package-based pricing is retainer. So that's similar because they get a suite of services or a package of services that is um, paid for on an ongoing basis. So that could be a monthly retainer, it could be a quarterly retainer. And it's a little trickier, so I would not recommend doing this with people you've never worked with before because a lot of time there's some hand-holding and nagging and administrative time that you don't know how long it's going to take you to work with them. How many revisions do they go through? There are so many aspects that are unknown, so my recommendation is start with project pricing and then evolve it into retainer a retainer arrangement if there is a need and if that would serve people. And often your clients will not offer it to you because they may not know that that would be better for everyone. But you can say, well, it looks like you have a need for more services, so I propose that we go to a retainer, and then you propose exactly how to do it. And again, a retainer is essentially, we're going to do th all of this for this much money, or we're going to spend this much time for this much money on a regular basis. And sometimes it's not exact, right? It has to come out in the wash from one, mo one month to the next. But if you have a strong relationship with your client and you have open communication, you can always say, all right, you know what, that's not working, let's try this, or we're a little over this month, here's what's gonna happen, or we're a little under this month. You can just talk about it with them and, and that can work out well. And the main benefit of retainers is that you know how much money is coming in from one month to the next and you're not in that feast or famine syndrome, which is really tricky for a lot of people. Blue Monkey makes a really good point. They say for their clients, they are. It makes they can impress on them that they are available immediately for urgent issues mm -hmm. if they are on a retainer. You can be on call, and mm -hmm. that's one of the benefits of having a retainer. And you know, it's funny because sometimes people say to me, "Well, I'm kind of on call anyway," and they don't know it. But that doesn't matter. You can say this is one of the benefits of paying on retainer. Justin, could you give a good example of a retainer, like a client that you're working with, that a successful retainer? Um, scenario? Sure. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, in fact, I showed them earlier RX Creative Lab. They offer retainers to associations who need uh, the same services every month or every quarter for their events. And they say for it's going gonna, it's gonna to take us X number of hours. Again, it could be based on hours, or it could be a scope of services and a payment plan. Sometimes the retainer is a payment plan for a scope of services. So for the next year, we're going to do this, 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 and this, and it's going to take a year, and we're going to charge you this much per month to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it would be appropriate for your business, but it's definitely worth thinking about. Mm. Anyone in the room use retainers? Do you, Reina? Yeah, I have a, I have a really great client um, that I've been with for seven years that I'm on a retainer with, and it really, it makes such a difference. To basically, we have an arrangement where they guarantee me 60 hours a month mm -hmm. uh, that they pay me for, but if I end up going over, I charge an hourly rate on top of that, and so I have my base is all covered every month. I know I'm getting this check and I don't have the fluctuation, which is just so helpful. Mm -hmm. And I think my goal um, for this year or going forward is to get um, at least another couple of retainer clients like that. Mm -hmm. And then there's just a lot less, you can have less clients and more work with the ones that you do work mm -hmm. with. And, Are yeah. there challenges in that type of situation for you? It's worked out really well for me. Yeah. Yeah. And do you agree then that the open communication is really important and the strong relationship? Yes. Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Zane, do you have any retainer arrangements? Yeah. Um, yeah, I find retainers to be really effective. I mean, they create predictability in your business, mm -hmm. and which is great. And uh, you're not, you know, it's, it's, it's really good. Yeah, I have a few as well. Yeah. Reina? I just thought of one thing that's sort of particular to that situation. Because I guarantee them so much of my time every month, I have an arrangement that if I'm out of town for three days or more, I have to supply um, somebody to take over for me. So mm -hmm. that that's a consideration, but mm -hmm. I think it's fair enough because they still pay me at the end of the month. So if I want to go out on vacation or something, I um, I train somebody and have them take over for me during that time. And 
um, and pay them out of my pocket, mm -hmm. but then I get paid by them. So, so uh, I'm channeling one of the questions that are probably coming up in response to that, which is, aren't you afraid that the person you bring in to replace you is going to take the client away from you? No. Why not? Because they're friends of mine and they're busy enough with their own work. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Good. All right. We have a question here about um, retainer based. Um, when you're actually using it, what is the frequency? Do you make it annual or monthly? Um, what, what is, or do you have to adjust for the Well, client? I would start with monthly. And I would even start with a trial period of two or three months. Because again, it takes time to get into a groove and see what is going to work for each situation. Right? So I think it's really important. And then eventually it could be annual if it's strong and if it, it, it works well for everybody. OK. All right, I just wanted to show you uh, a screenshot. This is from JillLynnDesign.com of her packages. And you can go on her website and see them a little bit more closely. But essentially, she has uh, four packages. And I love the way she has best value as a little icon on the one that is the best value. And the most popular is another one, right? So this is a way of really um, kind of directing people to see what you want them to see and perhaps buy what you want them to buy, right? Tell them it's the most popular. That's a little psychological psychology of pricing trick because people like to follow what's popular and it works. So, and you can see that there are differences between the packages and you can click on the details and see what exactly is involved in each one. So that's a perfect example and just a little plug if you don't mind for the package pricing bundle which includes this and an analysis of this and two other Pack, um, designers with their packages, and that's in the marketing-mentor.com online store. Oh, look, that's what I have the cover of. Here's the package pricing bundle. I'm anticipating myself. All right. The fourth pricing strategy is value-based pricing. So we touched on this a little bit in session two, and this tends to be the most complex or the most challenging for people to, to understand and to do. And I want to uh, emphasize that it's not right for everyone. It's not right for every creative, and it's not right for every uh, client. But the idea here is that if you can ask and find out what the value is or the potential value is to your client of the thing that you're doing, no matter what it is, then your price could be based on that. So I'll give you an example, and then maybe, Zane, you can talk a little bit more also about how you do value-based pricing. But um, I was doing a, uh, a marketing project for a client, and I knew that she stood to earn $100,000 as a result of the marketing effort that we were doing together. And I proposed to her that my fee not be based on my time, but it be based on a percentage of what she was going to earn potentially from that. Right? So it could be 10%, it could be 1%. You negotiate that percentage. But the idea is, what are you trying to do with this? And let the fee be based on that. And we're not talking about a royalty here. We're not talking about a commission. We're saying, here's what the potential is, and I have a stake in it because I'm going to make it as good as it can be. So Zane, tell us a little bit about your value-based pricing. Be as specific as you can. Yeah, so for value-based pricing, I use this typically for e-commerce projects. Mm -hmm. So usually I start off with the goals of what the client, how much the client is looking to generate in a monthly base, on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, based on that, I try to price the project, give them an estimate on, uh, based on the percentage of how, how much revenue that they're going to generate and uh, quote them on that. Uh, for me, like the realization of uh, value-based pricing came after reading an uh, ebook by the founder of FreshBooks, actually. Mm -hmm. He wrote a, a really cool ebook called uh, Breaking the Time Barrier, mm -hmm. uh, which he talks about how he was able to use value-based pricing for his consulting business that he used to actually fund F FreshBooks. Yep. So I highly recommend um, a lot of the audience to watch that and, or read that. <laughs> And uh, you know he talks more about how he, how he came upon the realization as well. Yes, absolutely. That is a great book. His yeah. name is Mike McDermott. Yeah. He's the CEO of FreshBooks. And uh, he has a very clear approach to it based on his own experience. Yeah. Excellent. All right. 
Now, before we wrap up this lesson, we have one more uh, issue to address, as I promised, which is this question of which is better, hourly pricing versus project pricing? Because this is the debate a lot of people are in. I imagine there might be a debate in the chat room going on about this too. Project pricing is clearer for everyone. Because if you quote hourly, people don't seem to realize that there's no context for it. If I say my hourly rate is $100 an hour or $50 an hour, and someone else says their hourly rate is $250 an hour, it sounds like they're more expensive than me, but we haven't said how much time we're talking about. And so when people compare your hourly rate to another person's hourly rate, they assume it's going to take the same amount of time, and it may not. They're also not telling you how much time it's going to take. Usually that's not part of the quote. So my suggestion is that you do project pricing because that basically means here's how much it's going to cost you, and this is what you're going to pay. It allows everybody to budget. You get to budget, you know what's coming in, they get to budget, they know what they're going to spend. It is much cleaner for everyone. Also, as I mentioned before, one of the reasons to avoid hourly pricing is because the better you get, the quicker you get, the less you make. That is absolutely not right, right? It's the opposite of what should be happening. Unless you just keep raising your hourly rate, at a certain point someone's going to say, that's too expensive, even though you're not telling them, it's only going to take me an hour, right? So there's just a lot of miscommunication, there's a lot of confusion around hourly pricing. It's, there are exceptions, I will give you the exceptions, because I'm trying to make a very strong point without being too absolute about it. There are exceptions. Sometimes there are clients who will only pay by the hour. The government is sometimes like that. Uh, corporations are sometimes like that. On a retainer, sometimes that is the only they will work with you on a retainer. And sometimes they want you to lower your hourly rate because they're guaranteeing you a certain amount of time, which can be negotiated. But again, I go back to the political situation where if someone just automatically says, what's your hourly rate, does not mean you have to charge them hourly just because that's the question they asked you. Right? You do not have to accept the premise of the question, and what you need to say is, I'm sorry, that's not how I charge. I don't quote my hourly rate. Here's how I charge. And that requires some strength, but it really works. It's not saying, I'm not going to charge you. It's just, here's how I work. Here's my policy. All right, before we get to the what would you do if, let's see if there are any questions in the room or in the chat room about this because i know it can be i see some i see some people with questions burgeoning i'm curious about like a mixed model where mm -hmm. um, let's say i'm creating an educational product and there's just some costs upfront costs that need, need to be covered mm -hmm. um, have you seen that before where yes. it's like value based do you have any advice around that absolutely um, and it can be tricky and as I said, I'm trying not to do black or white, but for example, I have one client, I was talking about uh, this with him yesterday morning before I came here. Actually, we were looking at a proposal and part of it is a website, it's for a website. So part of it is here's the design fee and then for the development, it's going to be based on an hourly rate and here's how many hours we estimate. And then of course you have to give the hourly rate, so you have to be careful. And sometimes, especially when it comes to revisions, if you're quoting revisions at an hourly rate, you can quote a much higher hourly rate than what everything else might be based on. Right? So yes, you could do a hybrid, you can mix it up. And I'm not saying don't ever tell your client your hourly rate, it's just that that's not your value. You want to change that mindset. Mm. Any other questions? Well, yes? I have a question online that sort of follows up from what Raina was asking earlier on and what Justin was just touching on, because okay. some people are confused about what is billable and what isn't. Um, and you know, if you're learning a skill to complete a project, is that going to be billable time? That's totally up to you, right? I mean, who pays for your learning curve? That's the question. Um, I have clients who split it, right? Because they may not be learning it if it weren't for that client. Mm -hmm. But it's probably not fair because it's going to take them more time to learn it, so they split the fee, basically. And you don't have to tell the client that, right? But that's an ethical way to, to consider it for yourself. 
And other people, uh, Costa has uh, asked about this, but are, are confused about how you are quoting for a giant corporation as opposed to if you're working with a very small business or indeed a self-employed person. He prefers all his pricing to be value-based, value but he, he appreciates that a big corporation is going to approach it completely differently to an individual. Right, and that's why it is specific to each situation. It is based on a conversation, and you might be able to persuade if you're dressed up, persuade uh, um, a corporation to pay based on value if you can make the argument, right? Because it may be, it may be a lower fee, it may be a higher fee, you don't know. Uh, the other point I wanna make about hourly pricing, one of the exceptions is that when there are clients who you know are going to be problematic and do many, many revisions or where uh, there's a committee and just lots of time will be taken that you haven't accounted for in your project fee, then you might want to charge parts of it hourly. Maybe that, at that point you do the revisions hourly. But keep that in mind that when there are a lot of unknowns, that may be a, a good reason to do a part of it hourly. Okay, so here is the what would you do if question. What if you've quoted a project fee for a project, but the client insists that you quote it hourly? So this is about what would you say, what would you do if you have already quoted in your proposal a project fee and the client comes back and says, no, no, we must have it hourly. It's not a trick question. Justin, what would you do? I guess just guess, you know, look at that, um, that number and, and kind of guesstimate how many hours it's going to take and then divide, it, mm -hmm. divide that up. Mm -hmm. That's one way. Yeah. Reina? Yeah, maybe you could... Um do that and then also limit the amount of hours that are included in mm -hmm. that rate mm -hmm. so that if there is scope creep or anything else, they realize they're going to have to pay more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would probably have a certain base and then also for additional services, charge them on an hourly basis. Mm -hmm. So suppose that they need extra hours, then I can put that in the proposal as well. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, based on how much you want this project, what else is on your plate? You might say, I'm sorry, I just don't work that way. And you've got all these other fish in the sea. You've got all these other prospects in your pipeline who are willing to pay on a project basis so that you can be profitable. Do we have comments in the chat room? We do, we have quite a few. Um, uh, uh, 318 Media is saying, I'd stress my process. I'd explain why I don't quite, qu uh, why I explain I don't quote our hourly and why. Mm -hmm. um, Deborah's saying, yes, I would ask why. Um, but Flux Appeal says, I would, well, the thing to do here is to contemplate what they're really trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. um, and that's interesting mm -hmm. too. Um, and people are saying, you know, you need to ask up front what the approval process is, and that way you can, you can adjust. Absolutely. All good ideas, no right answer here. Sometimes tricky. So really needs attention and thought. All right, so wrapping up this lesson for four pricing strategies in the workbook. If it's not clear yet, there is a short article outlining each of these pricing strategies so you can understand what they are. And the question is, and let's just do this quickly uh, with the in-studio audience, which strategy is the best for you of those four? Maybe based on what you've done so far, or maybe based on aspirationally where you're going in the future of the four strategies, time-based, project-based, package-based, or value-based, which one do you think is the best for you, Justin? Um, honestly, I see multiple ones working for me. Okay. Um, you know, like having um, the package base around consulting people, like, like over Skype, um, helping people with content, mm -hmm. and then, I somehow see a hybrid model of the value-based um, and project-based, mm -hmm. so somehow like an, a fee um, up front um, with um, some sort of, um, uh, I guess, just uh, percentage like based on, on sales. Mm -hmm. So It's always good to have skin in the game, too. Yeah. It yeah. helps. Yeah. Uh, definitely a mix for me, too, mm -hmm. depending on what the project is. I, um, mostly built by the project so for most projects right now it's project based i do want to move more towards the value base so mm -hmm. where it applies and where it works mm -hmm. um, and then only use hourly for things like maintenance and, and hourly based retainers mm -hmm. yeah.
Excellent. Dane? Yeah, for me, I think the focus now will be more having a value-based base price mm -hmm. and then having a, pa a retainer package. Mm -hmm. This way, I can create predictability on a monthly basis and only serve like small number of clients and do a really good job for them. So based on the value, the base price, and then monthly retainer through the package pricing. Excellent. Excellent. It seems that most people um, like project pricing, Crown View, Amy, uh, they're all saying Kristen W, but Flux Appeal and, M and Mon London are saying they have a, a, a project a, a or a package price. They, they de it depends on what the client actually needs mm -hmm. and, and what the actual scope of work is. Right, and as I said in session one, one of the most important skills and talents and qualities to make this kind of life work is flexibility. And this is one of the ways you need to be flexible in order to know where you're going and what you're going to achieve. And Jeff Great. Large has done that. He said they did do hourly, but they converted to project and creating packages. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, I'll just bring a small example, sort okay. of as a word of warning. And in, in, I went very creative with one client last year who had budget problems. Um, I really trusted them. I really wanted to work with them. So I sort of spaced out all the pricing over the year mm -hmm. um, with their estimated launch time for this website and estimated sales at a certain point would pay the full amount. In the meantime, there were so many hours included for uh, in, the, in the retainer, basically in the monthly retainer, and everything that went over would also be paid at the end of the year, and it just got so confusing. Mm. And, it was, it was kind of a nightmare. Yeah. I, I don't think I'll ever do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for that word of warning. Good. OK. Right, so keep it simple. I think that is the point, is keep it simple. And also, I will talk about this a little bit more later, but the idea of tying the payments to the milestones in the project is tricky because if the project gets delayed, then your cash flow is affected. So I have some solutions for that, which we'll talk about later, but just be careful. In, instead, the alternative is tying the payments to the calendar on a monthly basis. It's almost like a retainer of sorts, but it's based on a project scope.